A Cap for Steve by Morley Callahan. Dave Diamond, a poor man, a carpenter's assistant, was a small, wiry, quick-tempered individual who had learned how to make every dollar count in his home. His wife, Anna, had been sick a lot, and his 12-year-old son, Steve, had to be kept in school. Steve, a big-eyed, shy kid, ought to have known the value of money as well as Dave did. It had been ground into him. But the boy was crazy for baseball, and after school, when he could have been working as a delivery boy or selling papers, he played ball with the kids. His failure to appreciate that the family needed a few extra dollars disgusted Dave. Around the house, he wouldn't let Steve talk about baseball, and he scowled when he saw him hurrying off with his glove after dinner. When the Phillies came to town to play an exhibition game with the home team and Steve pleaded to be taken to the ballpark, Dave, of course, was outraged. Steve knew they couldn't afford it, but he had gotten his mother on his side. Finally, Dave made a bargain with them. He said that if Steve came home after school and worked hard helping to make some kitchen shelves, he would take him that night to the ballpark. Steve worked hard, but Dave was still resentful. They had to coax him to put on his good suit. When they started out, Steve held aloof, feeling guilty, and they walked down the street like strangers. Then Dave glanced at Steve's face and half ashamed, took his arm more cheerfully. As the game went on, Dave had to listen to Steve's recitation of the batting average of every filly that stepped up to the plate. The time that boy must have wasted learning these averages began to appall him. He showed it so plainly that Steve felt guilty again and was silent. After the game, Dave let Steve drag him onto the field to keep him company while he tried to get some autographs from the Philly players who were being hemmed in by gangs of kids blocking the way to the clubhouse. But Steve, who was shy, let the other kids block him off from the players. Steve would push his way in, get blocked out, and come back to stand mournfully beside Dave. And Dave grew impatient. He was wasting valuable time. He wanted to get home. Steve knew it and was worried. Then the big blonde Philly outfielder, Eddie Candon, who had been held up by a gang of kids tugging at his arm and thrusting their scorecards at him, broke loose and made a run for the clubhouse. He was jostled in his blue cap with it, the red peak tilted far back on his head and fell off. It fell at Steve's feet, and Steve stooped quickly and grabbed it. Okay, son, the outfielder called, turning back. But Steve, holding the hat in both hands, only stared at him. Give him the cap, Steve, Dave said, smiling apologetically at the big outfielder who towered over them. But Steve drew the hat closer to his chest. In an odd trance, he looked up at the big Eddie Condon. It was an embarrassing moment. All the other kids were watching. Some shouted, give him his cap! My cap, son, Eddie Condon said. He, his hand out, Steve, hey Steve, Dave said, and he gave him a shake. But he had to jerk the cap out of Steve's hand. Here you are, he said. The outfielder, noticing Steve's white, worshipping face and pleading eyes, grinned and then shrugged. Ah, let him keep it, he said. No, Mr. Condon, you, you don't need to do that, Dave protested. It's happened before, forget it, Eddie Condon said, and he trotted away to the clubhouse. Dave handed the cap to Steve. Envious kids circled around them, and Steve said, He said I could keep it, Dad. You heard him, didn't you? Yeah, I heard him, Dave admitted. The wonder in Steve's face made him smile. He took the boy by the arm and then hurried off the field. On the way home, Dave couldn't get him to talk about the game. He couldn't get him to take his eyes off the cap. Steve could hardly believe his own happiness. See? He said suddenly. And he showed Dave and Eddie, Eddie Condon's name was printed on the sweatband. Then he went on dreaming. Finally, he put the cap on his head and turned to Dave with a slow, proud smile. The cap was oh, way too big for him. It fell down over his eyes. Never mind, Dave said. You can get your mother to take a tuck in the back. When they got home, Dave was tired and his wife didn't understand the cap's importance and they couldn't get Steve to go to bed. He swaggered around wearing the cap and looking in the mirror every ten minutes. He took the cap to bed with him. Dave and his wife had a cup of coffee in the morning and Dave told her again how they had got the cap. They agreed that their boy must have an attractive quality that showed in his face and that Eddie Condon must have been drawn to him. Why else would he have singled Steve out from all the kids? But Dave got tired of the fuss Steve made over the cap and of the way he wore it from the time he got up in the morning until the time he went to bed. Some kid was always coming in wanting to try on the cap. It was 
childish, Dave said, for Steve to go around assuming that the cat made him important in the neighborhood, and to keep telling them how he had become a leader in the park a few blocks away, where he played ball in the evenings. And Dave wouldn't stand for Steve keeping the cap on while he was eating. He was always scolding his wife for accepting Steve's explanation that he'd forgotten he had it on. Just the same, it was remarkable what a little thing like a ball cap could do for a kid. Dave admitted to his wife, and he smiled to himself. One night, Steve was coming home from the park. Dave didn't realize how late it was until he put down his newspaper and watched his wife in the window. Her re restlessness got on his nerves. See, what comes from encouraging the boy to hang around with those park loafers, he said. I don't encourage him, she protested. You do, he insisted irritably, for he was really worried now. A, a gang hung around the park until midnight. It was a bad park, it was true, that on one side there was a good district uh, with fine, expensive apartment houses, but the kids from the neighborhood left the park to the kids from the poorer homes. When his wife went out and walked down to the corner, it was his turn to wait and worry and watch at the win open window. Each waiting moment tortured him. At last he heard his wife's voice and Steve's voice, and he relaxed and sighed, and he remembered his duty and rushed angrily to meet them. I'll fix you, Steve, once and for all. He said, I'll show you. You can't start coming into the house at midnight. Hold your horses, Dave. His wife said, can't you see the state he's in? Steve looked utterly exhausted and beaten. What's the matter? Dave asked quietly. I lost my cap, Steve whispered. He walked past his father and threw himself on the couch in the living room and lay with his face hidden. Now, don't scold him, Dave, his wife said. Scold him? Who's scolding him? Dave said indignantly. It's his cap, not mine. If it's not worth his while to hang on to it, why should I scold him? But he was implying resentfully that he alone recognized the cap's value. So you are scolding him, his wife said. It's his cap, not yours. What's happened, Steve? Steve told him he'd been playing ball, and he found that when he ran the bases, the cap fell off. It was still too big despite the tuck his mother had taken in the band. So the next time he came to bat, he tucked the cap in his hip pocket. Someone had lifted it. He was sure. And he didn't even know whether it was still in his pocket? Dave said sarcastically. It wasn't careless, Dad. Steve said for the last three hours, he had been wandering around to the homes of the kids who had been at the park at the time. He, he wanted to go on, but he was too tired. Dave knew the boy was apologizing to him, but he didn't know why. It, it made him angry. If he didn't hang on to it, it's not worth worrying about now, he said, and he sounded offended. After that night, they knew that Steve didn't go to the park to play ball. He went to look for the cap. It irritated Dave to see him sit around listlessly or walk in circles trying to force his memory to find a particular incident which would suddenly recall to him the moment when the cap had been taken. It was no attitude for a growing, healthy boy to take, Dave complained. He told Steve firmly, once and for all, that he didn't want to hear any more about the cap. One night, two weeks later, Dave was walking home with Steve from the shoemakers. It was a hot night. When they passed an ice cream parlor, Steve slowed down. I guess I could have a soda, could I? Steve said. Nothing doing, Dave said firmly. Come on now, he added, as Steve hung back, looking in the window. Dad, look! Steve cried suddenly, pointing at the window. My cap! There's my cap! He's coming out! A well-dressed boy was leaving the ice cream parlor. He had on a blue ball cap with a red peak, just like Steve's cap. Hey, you, Steve cried, and he rushed at the boy, his small face fierce and his eyes wild. Before the boy could back away, Steve had snatched the cap from his head. That's my cap, he shouted. What's this? The bigger boy said, hey, give me my cap or I'll give you a poke on the nose. Dave was surprised that his own shy boy did not back away. He watched him clutch the cap in his left hand, half crying with excitement, as he put his head down and drew back his right fist. He was willing to fight, and Dave was proud of him. Wait now, Dave said. Take it easy, son, he said to the other boy who refused to back away. My boy says it's his cap, Dave said. Well, it's crazy. It's my cap. I was with him when he got the cap. When the Phillies played here, and it's a Philly cap. Eddie Condon gave it to me, Steve said. And you stole it from me, you jerk. Call me a jerk, you little squirt. I never saw you before in my life. Look, Steve said, pointing to the printing in the cap sweatband. It's Eddie Condon's cap, see? See, see, Dad? Yeah, you're right, son. Ever see this boy before, Steve? No, Steve said reluctantly. The other boy realized he might lose his cap. I bought it from a guy, he said. I paid him. My father knows I paid him. He says he got the cap from the ballpark. He groped up for some magically impressive words and suddenly found them. You'll have to speak to my father, he said. 
Sure, I'll speak to your father, Dave said. What's your name? Where do you live? My name's Hudson. I live about ten minutes away on the other side of the park. The boy appraised Dave, who wasn't any bigger than he was, and who wore a faded blue windbreaker and no tie. My father's a lawyer, he said boldly. He wouldn't let me keep the cap if he didn't think I should. Is that a fact? Dave said belligerently. Well, we'll see. Come on, let's go. And he got between the two boys and they walked along the street. They didn't talk to each other. Dave knew the Hudson boy was waiting to get the protection of his home, or get to the protection of his home, and Steve knew it too, and he, he looked up apprehensively at Dave, and Dave, reaching for his hand, squeezed it encouragingly and strode along, cocky and belligerent, knowing that Steve relied on him. The Hudson boy lived in the row of fine apartment houses on the other side of the park. At the entrance to one of these houses, Dave tried not to hang back and show he was impressed, because he could feel Steve hanging back. When they got into the small elevator, Dave didn't know why he took off his hat. It... In the carpeted hall on the fourth floor, the Hudson boy said just a minute and entered his own apartment. Dave and Steve were left alone in the corridor, knowing that the other boy was preparing his father for the encounter. Steve looked anxiously at his father, and Dave said, Don't worry, son, he added resolutely. No one's putting anything over on us. A tall, balding man in a brown velvet smoking jacket suddenly opened the door. David never seen a man wearing one of those jackets, although he had seen them in department store windows. Good evening, he said, making a, a depreciatory gesture at the cap. Steve still clutched tightly in his left hand. My boy didn't get your name. My name is Hudson. Mine's Diamond. Come on in, Mr. Hudson said, putting out his hand and laughing good-naturedly. He led Dave and Steve into the living room. What's this about the cap, he asked. The way kids can get excited about a cap. Well, it's understandable, isn't it? So it is, Dave said, moving closer to Steve, who was awed by the broad room rug and the fine furniture. He wanted to show Steve he was at ease himself, and he wished Mr. Hudson would be so polite. He wished, sorry, that Mr. Hudson wouldn't be so polite. That meant Dave had to be polite and affable, too, and it was hard to manage when he was standing in the middle of the floor in his own windbreaker. Sit down, Mr. Diamond, Mr. Hudson said. Dave took Steve's arm and sat, down, sat him down beside him on the Chesterfield. The Hudson boy watched his father, and Dave looked at Steve and saw that he wouldn't face Mr. Hudson or the other boy. He kept looking at Dave, putting all his faith in him. Well... Mr. Diamond, from what I gathered from my boy, you're able to prove this cap belonged to your boy. That's a fact, Dave said. Mr. Diamond, you'll have to believe my boy bought the cap from some kid in good faith. I, I don't doubt it, Dave said, but no kid can sell something that doesn't belong to him. You know that's a fact, Mr. Hudson. Yes, that's a fact, Mr. Hudson agreed. But the cap means a lot to my boy, Mr. Diamond. It means a lot to my boy too, Mr. Hudson. Sure it does. But supposing we call in a policeman. You know what he'd say? He'd ask you if you were willing to pay my boy what he paid for the cap. That's usually the way it works out, Mr. Hudson said, friendly and smiling, as he eyed Dave shrewdly. That's not right. It's not justice, Dave protested. Not when it's my boy's cap. I know it isn't right, but that's what they'll do. All right. What did you say your boy paid for the cap, Dave said reluctantly. Two dollars. Two dollars, Dave repeated. Mr. Hudson's smile was still kindly. But his eyes were shrewd, and Dave knew the lawyer was counting on his not having the two dollars. Mr. Hudson thought he and Dave had Dave sized up. He looked at him and decided he was broke. Dave's pride was hurt, and he turned to Steve. What he saw in Steve's face was more powerful than the hurt to his pride. It was the memory of how difficult it had been to get an extra nickel. The talk he heard about the cost of food, the worry in his mother's face as she tried to make ends meet, and the bewildered embarrassment that he was here in a rich man's home, forcing his father to confess that he couldn't afford to spend two dollars. Then Dave grew angry and reckless. I'll give you the two dollars, he said. Steve looked at the Hudson boy and grinned brightly. The Hudson boy watched his father. I suppose that's fair enough, Mr. Hudson said. A cap like this can't be wor can, can be worth a lot to a kid. You know how it is. Your boy might want to sell, I mean, be satisfied. Would he take five dollars for it? Five dollars? Dave repeated. Is it worth five dollars, Steve? He asked uncertainly. Steve shook his head and looked frightened. No thanks, Mr. Hudson, Dave said firmly. 
I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. Hudson said. I'll give you $10. The cap has a sentimental value for my boy, a Philly cap, a big leaguer's cap. It's, it's only worth about a buck and a half, really, he added. But Dave shook his head again. Mr. Hudson frowned. He looked at his own boy with indulgent concern, but now he was embarrassed. I'll tell you what I'll do, he said. This cap, well, it's worth as much as a day at the circus to my boy. Your boy should be re uh, recompensed. Uh, I want to be fair. Here's $20. And he held out two $10 bills to Dave. That much money for a cap, Dave thought, and his eyes brightened. But he knew what the cap had meant to Steve. To deprive him of it now, that it was within his reach, would be unbearable. All the things he needed in his life gathered around him. His wife was there, saying he couldn't afford to reject the offer. He had no right to do it. And he turned to Steve to see if Steve thought it wonderful that the cap could bring them $20. What do you say, Steve? He said uneasily. I, I don't know, Steve said. He was in a trance. When Dave smiled, Steve smiled too. And Dave believed that Steve was as impressed as he was, only more bewildered and maybe even more aware that they could not possibly turn away that much money for a ball cap. Well, here you are, Mr. Hudson said, and he put the two bills in Steve's hand. It's a lot of money, but I guess you had a right to expect as much. With a dazed, fixed smile, Steve handed the money slowly to his father, and his face was white. Laughing jovially, Mr. Hudson led them to the door. His own boy followed a few paces behind. In the elevator, Dave took the bills out of his pocket. See, Stevie, he whispered eagerly, that windbreaker you wanted and, and ten dollars for your bank. Won't mother be surprised? Yeah, Steve whispered, a little smile still on his face. But Dave had to turn away quickly so their eyes wouldn't meet, for he saw that it was, was a, a scared smile. Outside, Dave said, hey, you want to carry the money home, Steve? You, you show it to your mother. No, you keep it. Steve said, and then there was nothing to say. They walked in silence. It's a lot of money, Dave said finally. When Steve didn't answer him, he added angrily, I, I turned to you, Steve. I asked you, didn't I? That man knew how much the boy wanted that cap, Steve said. Sure, but he recognized how much it was worth to us. No, you let him take it away from us, Steve blurted. That's unfair, Dave said. Don't dare say that to me. I don't want to be like you, Steve muttered, and he darted across the road and walked along on the other side of the street. It's, it's unfair, Dave said angrily, only now he didn't mean that Steve was unfair. He meant that what had happened in the prosperous Hudson home was unfair, and he didn't know quite why. He'd been trapped, not just by Mr. Hudson, but by his own life. Across the road, Steve was hurrying along with his head down, wanting to be alone. They walked most of the way home on opposite sides of the street until Dave could stand it no longer. Steve, he called crossing the street. It was very unfair, I mean, for you to say. But Steve started to run. Dave walked as fast as he could, and Steve was getting beyond that. And he felt enraged and suddenly yelled, Steve! And he started to chase his son. He wanted to get a hold of Steve and, and pound him. He, he didn't know why. He gained on him. He, he gasped for breath, and he almost got him by the shoulder. Turning, Steve saw his father's face in the street, light, and was terrified. He circled away, got to the house, and rushed in, yelling, Mother! Son! Son! She cried, rushing to the kitchen. As soon as she threw her arms around Steve, shielding him, Dave's anger left him. He felt stupid. He walked past them into the kitchen. What happened? She asked anxiously. Have you both gone crazy? What did you do, Steve? Nothing, he said sullenly. What did your father do? We found the boy with my ball cap, and he let the boy's father take it from us. No, no, Dave protested. Nobody pushed us around. The man didn't put anything over us. He felt tired, and his face was burning. He told what had happened. Then he slowly took out two $10 bills out of his wallet and tossed them on the table and looked up guiltily at his wife. It hurt him that she didn't pick up the money and that she didn't rebuke him. It's a lot of money, son, she said slowly. Your father was only trying to do what he knew was right, and it'll work out, and you'll understand. She was soothing Steve, but Dave knew she felt that she needed to be gentle with him, too, and he was ashamed. When she went with Steve to his bedroom, Dave sat by himself. His son had contempt for him, he thought. His son, for the first time, had seen how easy it was for another man to handle him, 
and he had judged him, and he had wanted to walk alone on the other side of the street. He looked at the money, and he hated the sight of it. His wife returned to the kitchen, made a cup of tea, talked soothingly, and said it was incredible that he had forced the Hudson man to pay him $20 for the cap. But all Dave could think of was, Steve was scared of me. Finally, he got up and went into Steve's room. The room was in darkness, but he could see the outline of Steve's body on the bed, and he sat down beside him and whispered, Look, son, it was a mistake. I know why. People like us, in circumstances where money can scare... No, no, he said, feeling ashamed and shaking his head apologetically. He was taking the wrong way of showing the boy they were together. He was covering up his own failure for... The failure had been his, and it had come out of being so separated from his son that he had been blind to what was beyond the price in a boy's life. His hand went out hesitantly to Steve's shoulder. Steve, look, he said eagerly. The trouble was I didn't realize how much I enjoyed it that night at the ballpark. If I had watched you playing for your own team, the kids around here say you could be a great pitcher. We could take that money and buy a new pitcher's glove for you and a, a catcher's mitch. Steve, Steve, are you listening? I could catch you, work with you in, in, in the lane. Maybe I could be your co coach. Watch you become a great pitcher. In the half darkness, he could see the boy's pale face turn to him. Steve, who had never heard his father talk like this, was shy and wondering. All he knew was that his father, for the first time, wanted to be with him in his hopes and adventures. He said, I guess... You do know how important the cap was. His hand went out to his father's arm. With that man, the cap was... Well, it was just something he could buy, eh, Dad? Dave gripped his son's hand hard. The wonderful generosity of childhood. The price a boy was willing to pay to be able to count on his father's admiration and approval. Made him feel humble. And then, strangely exulted.